So why prostate cancer? Why do I do what I do? Um, you know, people always ask, even when, I, usually when I'm doing vasectomies in the office, how did you get into urology? And that's exactly why I do urology, that the, the breadth of pathology uh, goes anywhere from prostate cancer to bladder cancer to kidney stones to incontinence issues to erectile issues to vasectomies in the office. So it's a good mix between office and, uh, and uh, OR uh, practice, um, particularly in oncology. So why prostate cancer? For me, it's a passion in helping men, men such as yourself, men that uh, have either um, started treatment, ended treatment years ago, or in the process of making management decisions. Uh, the, the breadth of prostate cancer, go, it's in left field and right field. So every man is different. That's the most important thing here, that every uh, it, prostate cancer is not uh, cut and dried to where every man gets the same treatment. Every man is um, uh, goes down a very algorithmic sort of pathway. Uh, there's a lot of factors, as we'll kind of talk about here shortly. Um, there's a physical, physical and emotional component. You know, cancer, you know, the word cancer, the big C is not uh, something that, um, you know, is to be taken lightly. You know, there's a physical component with it as it relates to side effect profiles, going to appointments, um, convalescence time, for instance, after surgery. And then there's also the emotional component when you, when you hear that big C word. Um, so I like managing both aspects of that. Um, then the ever-changing landscape, as you can see down here in these charts, um, prostate cancer can span years, uh, decades even, uh, and the landscape is always changing. And the time that it takes from a man to get diagnosed uh, with some of the lower-grade cancers to the time cancer, for instance, could metastasize, we'll probably have another five or 10 drugs out there for advanced prostate cancer. So, you know, from the time here, you know, the initial diagnosis, uh, this is sort of the area where we're talking more about localized disease, uh, removal of the prostate radiation therapy, cyber knife therapy, cryoablation, um, focal therapy for prostate cancer, all of these sorts of things. And then we know that at some point, um, hopefully long after we've left this earth, but at some point, um, you know, cancers do and can come back where we institute some hormone shots to drive the PSA back down and then flash forward one to two to four to eight to 10 years, uh, it can lead to uh, some pretty impactful side effects and symptoms. And, and this is where a lot of the growth of prostate cancer um, uh, research, development of new drugs, um, treatment modalities, uh, imaging studies is really uh, uh, going. So, so with that being said, um, you know, we, I, I received several questions, which I put in PowerPoint form, so we'll kind of go through it, um, about uh, some nuances in the screening recommendations. Uh, what I think of regarding the United States Preventative Service Task Force recommendations, some of the controversies, some of the pros and cons, under treatment versus over treatment, being sort of the main uh, issue here. You know, on the one hand, uh, there's this idea of not screening, and now you under treat men. Um, flash forward years on the line, they start getting bone pain, blood in the urine, pelvic pain, requiring narcotics and have you sort of missed the boat, so to speak, in terms of offering them cure, as opposed to over-treatment, where uh, we're removing prostates too early, um, where men could have survived on active surveillance, um, or there were uh, less aggressive treatment modalities where they would have lived just as long, uh, or you could have just not done anything and see how they did. Um, We'll talk a little bit about diagnosis and then a little bit about the treatment as it relates to some of the questions I received. So the first question that I had received is regarding screening, does Christ Hospital support the United States Preventive Service Task Force recommendation again, uh, against across the board routine PSA testing in spite of recent findings of a rise in cases of advanced prostate cancer? 
So this, this is an excellent question that gets down to screening recommendations. Um, I've put a copy of the United States Preventative Service Task Force recommendations here, and these were revised recommendations uh, updated in 2018. Uh, initially, these recommendations had said something completely different in 2012, which was don't screen anybody. Um, and I think part of the reason uh, they ended up revising this was uh, they received a lot of backlash of not having any urologist on the USPSTF task force. Um, so it was either primary care docs or PhDs or uh, oncologists and other uh, uh, radiation oncologists or medical oncologists, but no urologist was on that. Um, and, and so they did uh, uh, look at um, the data once again. The other thing is there was an introduction of new data from 2012 to 2018 longer term uh, prospective trials that looked at screening protocols, et cetera, or trials that were started in uh, the early 90s. Uh, PSA came out in 1994. So trials that may have started around that time had kind of matured uh, 30 years down the line. And so they added some of that into those recommendations. Um, so essentially the old recommendations were, we're over treating, we're over screening, where don't don't check PSAs in men, and obviously as a you know urologist, um, uh, we get to see men during all aspects of prostate cancer, and I'll be the first to tell you that I came out into practice uh, as a practicing urologist in 2014. Okay, so uh, over the last eight to ten years, I have been unfortunate. Uh, to see men that were not screened in light of those 2012 recommendations uh, that have ended up uh, having cancers that could very well have been treated, managed early, in remission, uh, and hopefully could have extended life. Um, now, that being said, it, hindsight's always 2020. It's hard to make those judgments that we should have, could have, would have. Um, but at the same point, uh, we know that we saw a slew of men that did have metastatic disease or what we call oligometastatic disease that went to the lymph nodes um, that we're now only getting good research on uh, to suggest that maybe localized treatment may actually help with those men. So once upon a time where we used to just give hormone shots, uh, now that treatment paradigm has changed um, to a point where we can now offer pill-formed hormone shots and radiation to still hopefully get uh, some of those men into remission. So um, risk factors that are sort of uh, that they were looking at older age, African American race. We do know that African American men have an increased risk of prostate cancer, increased risk of prostate cancer related death and increased uh, chance of getting prostate cancer earlier. So when we talk about screening recommendations, uh, if you read through the details of the USPSTF uh, recommendations, uh, they actually say that, for instance, African-American men uh, may benefit from early screening. Um, family history of prostate cancer as well is something that we look at uh, as well. These Screening modalities, we're essentially looking at PSA and digital rectal exam. I know a lot of the primary care docs are kind of uh, getting away from digital rectal exams uh, here, but I think that it is very important from a urologist uh, standpoint to do a digital rectal exam. Number one, we do a lot of digital rectal exams, um, and we can pick up on subtleties and abnormal exams uh, that may not necessarily translate to doing a biopsy immediately, but it may translate to us doing an MRI, for instance, which has been very well validated in the literature uh, to be an excellent uh, imaging modality uh, to see whether or not, um, you know, a biopsy must be done. Or more importantly, uh, if someone's had a prior negative biopsy, an MRI is exceptional uh, in terms of delineating where to actually take the biopsies. So more goal-directed biopsies, more image-guided biopsies to increase uh, uh, the diagnostic capability. Um, uh, I did receive a question. Do, does anybody have any questions about um, the USPSTF task force uh, recommendations? I guess 
to, to answer the initial question, which is, what are my thoughts on it? Um, no, man is the, no man is the same. I think that agree with the part of the recommendation that, uh, recommendation that says that men 55 to 69, uh, it should be discussed. Um, I also feel as though men with risk factors, including age, African-American race, uh, and family history of prostate cancer, I do think that they should be screened. Um, you know, when to screen is up for debate. The old recommendations were every one to two years after age 50, uh, unless you had a family member that had had prostate cancer. And if that happened to be in the 50s, then the recommendation was to do it at least five years prior uh, to when they were diagnosed. Of course, if that was age 50 or 51 or 52, we generally did a one-time PSA of 45. And if that number was low, then we'd you know, decide when to do the next PSA screening, which generally would have been 50. So um, I do believe wholeheartedly in PSA screening. Um, there are some caveats here. You know, if I have a, you know, 68-year-old man with, you know, a prior PSA 10 years back of 0.5, and he's had multiple strokes and diabetes and high blood pressure and morbid obesity and multiple abdominal surgeries and uh, heart cats um, uh, or, or open heart surgery, those are the men that I generally say there's other bigger fish to fry. Prostate cancer is probably a little bit further down on, on things to sort of uh, worry about um, because, as I mentioned earlier, there is that emotional aspect uh, to it. Uh, and sometimes doing the right thing is not screening. Um, the way that I usually explain it to men when I get referred a man for prostate cancer screening is I say, when, number one, what do you want out of all of this, right? So I only order tests if that test is going to impact the next step, which is going to impact the next step, which is going to impact the next step, which is very well why when I see 80-year-old men in my office that, are referred for a PSA, let's say a five, I say, okay, if your PSA is elevated, would you want a biopsy? If you wanted a biopsy, would you want to know uh, what type of cancer you were? And would you more importantly want to have some sort of treatment? Uh, and if the answer is, well, no, I'm 80 years old, I wouldn't want treatment, then I say, you don't need the biopsy. And if you don't need the biopsy, you probably don't need to be checking the PSA, right? Because every test that we order is with the idea that we are going to use that information to guide next steps and to guide management decisions. Uh, if the answer right off the bat is, look, I, you know, uh, I'm not interested in ha having any sort of procedural intervention or treatment or any of those things. If my risk of dying of prostate cancer is low at age 69 or 70, then I say, well, then, you know, are we uh, really giving you any benefit? Now, we do know that some of these men who are 65, 67, 69, they do live till 90, right? So we're not talking about a 10-year plan anymore. We're talking about a 20 to 30-year plan. And so I do have some issue with just stopping screening at age 70. I think there are plenty of healthy men that could live to age 90 um, with good quality of life. That's the key with good quality of life. Uh, and so making a blanket statement to just not screen those men, I think, is uh, a little bit short-sighted. So the next question that I did get um, was in Dr. Albin's book. Um, this is uh, uh, Dr. Albin actually discovered and invented the PSA test um, back in earlier than 1994, but it was FDA approved in 1994. Uh, he said that he wishes he had never discovered it. Uh, any idea why he might have said this? So a little bit of background um, about, you know, what Dr. Albin, you know, what his mindset was. He published a book called The Great uh, Prostate Hoax back in 2013. This was at a time just after those initial USPSTF uh, recommendations had come out, uh, claiming nobody should be, you know, screened. Um, the PSA test, as I mentioned, was approved in 1994. Dr. Alman's main concern was he had made this PSA test more uh, as a test to monitor prostate cancers, not necessarily for their diagnostic sort of capabilities. Um, you also have to realize back in the 90s, early 2000s, 
we were still figuring out how to use PSA as not only a diagnostic or screening, or I guess more of a screening tool, but also how to monitor it after radiation, for instance, or surgery, for instance. So, you know, even what's changed from, you know, who knows what my answer would have been back in 2012, 2011, in the 90s, but I can assuredly say here in, you know, 2022, uh, I do wish that the PSA test, you know, was done, but I also uh, qualify that with, I, you know, it, it is important to know what you're using it for, how to use it, who to screen, as we've sort of talked about before. Dr. Alvin's main concern at that time was he was worried about the profitability by big pharma that, you know, hey, I've produced this test, we're checking it on every single man, uh, we're not actually, you know, extending the survival of these men uh, by checking this test, we're doing a lot of unnecessary, unnecessary testing, unnecessary prostate biopsies, um, unnecessary cancer surgeries. And you got to realize back in the 90s and early 2000s, before the advent of robotic surgery, these were all open operations. You know, these were operations that were uh, below the belly button down to the pubic bone. Uh, you spend four to six days in the hospital. Uh, you assuredly had incontinence issues. You assuredly had a drain. You had a catheter in for maybe 10 days, four to six days in the hospital. Perhaps you had some bowels that had shut down, uh, and so there was significant constipation. And convalescence time was significantly longer. Um, you also had perineal prostatectomies at that time, where they were making an incision, if not in the lower abdomen, uh, just behind the scrotum and in front of the anus, which also had its own uh, morbidity. Um, so uh, something to think about. Um, it wasn't until later when, you know, we actually stopped screen or some of the primary care docs stopped screening that we started to see men with the advanced prostate cancer. Uh, and so, as I mentioned before, now that I've been in practice for nine, you know, nine years, um, I have seen the men that I've caught prostate cancer early and I've seen them eight years down the line uh, with an undetectable PSA minimal, if any, incontinence symptoms, uh, good erections, but also I've seen those men that, you know, are 65 years old with metastatic castration-resistant disease, which could very well have been prevented. So it's it's a risk-benefit, pro versus con sort of um, uh, discussion. Um, remember, screening is not just about preventing death. Yes, the ultimate endpoint in all of these studies is overall survival when you talk about clinically speaking. But you also have to think about the emotional and physical impact of not diagnosing prostate cancer till late. And now you're having bone pains and a PSA of a thousand and blood in your urine and uh, 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 pelvic pain, uh, narcotic usage, bowel dysfunctions. So there's a lot of downstream sort of uh, things for lack of screening that I'm not saying that all of these things would happen, but certainly something we need to think about when we're uh, talking about whether to, to screen or not. Um, risk versus benefits. You know, that whole idea of are we over-treating men versus under-treating men? You know, if you over-treat men, patients may have lived a full life without treatment or having any side effects. Um, you know, and that's great, but you could have also under-treated men uh, that had slipped through the cracks, so to speak, and now they have to deal with, you know, uh, difficult uh, grave disease consequences um, uh, such as, uh, you know, hormone replacement uh, or uh, hormone therapy like Lupron or Firmagon, um, some of those medications that can cause uh, bone remodeling issues, um, osteoporosis, fatigue, breast development, weight gain, nipple tenderness, um, hot flashes, all of these, all of these sorts of things. So the next question is, you know, what is my opinion on the strategy of routine PSA testing as a first step uh, in diagnosis? Should it be confirmed by biomarker testing in our, or MRI? So to answer this question, you know, I, I do believe in PSA uh, testing. Now, some of that is there's a little bit of bias because I see a lot of prostate cancer patients. Um, but as I've sort of talked about, you know, earlier, 
I'm looking at not just your age. Age is only one part of the big picture here in terms of screening. I'm looking at your age. I'm looking at your family history. Uh, we know that I'm looking at race. Uh, for instance, we talked about African-American males earlier. Family history is an interesting one. You know, if you have three first degree uh, relatives that have had prostate cancer, you may be one of the 10% of men that has some sort of genetic, uh, some genetic hereditary um, issue that it may pass down generation to generation. So I think genetic testing is extremely important there. Um, did I have a question or no? Okay. Um, there's other factors that I look at. What is your overall health? What is your perception of your of your overall health? There's some men that say, "I'm I run five miles a day. I don't have very many medical issues. Um, I am, you know, uh, I feel like I have ten good years of quality of life left in me." And there's men that say that, but then they've had four blood four blood vessels operated on in their heart. They live a relatively sedentary lifestyle. Um, smokers. Um, may have had some other issues like hypertension, poorly controlled diabetes, uh, hyperlipidemia. So uh, I look at both sides of that, not only what their overall health is, but what their perception of their health is. Life expectancy, uh, we kind of touched on that a little bit earlier. Um, there may be 69, 70-year-old men that have family members that have lived to 95 or 100 with good quality of life, but not just how long that they lived, but um, how are they living their own lives? You know, uh, you can, your dad may live to a hundred, but uh, if you have a lot of medical issues and are not taking care of yourself, you may not, right? So that's only a piece of the puzzle. What is your willingness to undergo treatment? It goes back to that question I asked earlier, which was, you know, what's the purpose of the PSA? The whole purpose of PSA is if it's abnormal, you're going to need a biopsy. If it's, if the biopsy is uh, it shows cancer that you're not a good active surveillance candidate, the recommendation is going to be treatment. If your answer was, well, I would have never wanted to be treat treated in the first place, uh, do, do we go that route in terms of screening? And then last but not uh, least, what side effects are you willing to put up with as it relates to treatment, right? Um, if you're like, I'm willing to put up with erectile dysfunction, um, incontinence on the front end, which do improve over time, um, then then surgery may be you know something that that uh, is worthwhile for you, um, or if you're like, look, erectile dysfunction is the most important thing to me, um, but you're willing to put up with urgency, frequency, uh, blood in the urine or stool, um, some fatigue, going uh, to get radiation treatments five days a week for four weeks or eight weeks. Um, are you willing to put up with that for the you know, benefit of maintaining your erections uh, at least over the next five to 10 years. So it's it's a nuanced sort of discussion. I think I treat every man uh, differently um, in terms of their particular circumstances. Uh, I do also want to make a point here that oftentimes when you come to the urologist, we're not starting the screening process, okay? We as a specialist, have received men that have been screened, and now we are talking to them having been screened about what the next steps are. So every now and then I do have a man that comes into my office that says, hey, I've got some prostate issues. Hey, I need I need my PSA checked, and he's never had a PSA checked. And that, those are the times when I'm having those discussions with men. Um, unlike the typical man I see in my office who has had his primary care doctor screen him, they found an elevation or an abnormality in a PSA exam or MRI, and now they're referred over to me. So we, in a sense, most of those men, I've already kind of skipped that screening step because they were pre-screened before they came and saw me. Um, so then a couple questions uh, about that I received about active surveillance. Um, regarding a positive biopsy, do you support active surveillance? And if so, for what grade groups? Uh, Follow-up question is, how are borderline decisions made? How is active surveillance carried out at Christ Hospital? And what is generally the follow-up? So I've kind of broken this down. Do I support active surveillance? Yes, absolutely, for the appropriate patients. Those three words are the key, for appropriate patients. 
Uh, not all men, not all men uh, are the same. Not all of their prostate cancers are the same. You may have Gleason three plus three prostate cancer, but it's in 100% of the cores in 12 cores uh, out of 12 biopsies, and you may be 50 years old, and you may not be an active surveillance candidate. In those situations, something like the Decipher test or Prolaris test, some of those epigenetic tests may be indicated, you know, because there may be a genetic uh, sort of uh, predisposition to the, that cancer worsening, even though on paper you have only a Gleason 6 prostate cancer. Um, but on the at the same point, I have some 69, 70-year-old men that have a score of 7, you know, Gleason 3 plus 4 prostate cancer, which technically is intermediate risk, um, but they may have 1 out of 12 cores that are positive, and there's an abundance of research coming out um, that says maybe some of those Gleason 7 low-volume, low-PSA men uh, would benefit from active surveillance, okay? Um, so do I support active surveillance? Yes, but for the appropriate patients. Um, and I'll kind of show you here shortly what my active surveillance uh, guideline uh, sort of is, the ones that I, I generally will follow. How are borderline decisions made? Again, we're looking at your overall health. I'm looking at your prior abdominal surgeries. I'm looking at uh, your you know, what your wishes are. The number one factor in prostate cancer treatment is actually what does the patient want? Um, if you look at most categories of prostate cancer risk, um, surgical removal of the prostate and radiation essentially have the same uh, cure rate. You know, we all, I always counsel men that I don't like throwing around words like cure. Um, I usually say we get it in remission. Remission long enough equates to cure, okay? Um, but the fact of the matter is, is technically speaking, prostate cancer can come back at any time. Generally speaking, our benchmark is about 10 years. If it hasn't come back after a prostatectomy in 10 years, um, it's a pretty low risk of coming back, um, but uh, it could still happen if there's any dormant cancer cells laying around. I think the first decision that should be made here is, should it be treated, right? So if I get a man with a uh, one out of 12 core Gleason 3 plus 4, or a man with one out of 12 core Gleason 6, the question first off is, should it be treated? As opposed to a man with Gleason 6 disease, PSA of 15, and 12 out of 12 cores positive. Once upon a time, we were taking every man, we were treating every single man who had Gleason 6 prostate cancer. Once upon a time, once upon a time they either got brachytherapy seeds, they got their prostates removed, or they got radiation therapy. Um, yes, did we overtreat men? 100%, we did. And then we learned Gleason 6, not all those men necessarily need to be treated. You can at least perform active surveillance on them where they're on the hamster wheel of just checking, rechecking PSAs, prostate exams, MRIs, et cetera. And if they ever had any worsening factors, like their PSA started really going up, or repeat biopsy did show worsening cancer or the volume of cancer went up, um, they get off that hamster wheel and now we open up the discussion again about treating for prostate cancer um, while not missing our window of opportunity of cure, okay? So first decision is, should it be treated? Second is, how do we treat it, okay? How's active surveillance carried out at TCH and what is follow-up? We I generally follow the active surveillance guidelines from, you know, MSKCC, um, from, you know, the white papers in uh, the American Urologic Association, National Comprehensive Cancer Network, um, you know, essentially I counsel on risks and benefits. I do a PSA about every four to six months. Um, if the PSA generally is below 10, I'll favor more of the six-month side of things. If it's over 10, I may do three to six months as opposed to four to six months at least for that first year, just to make sure that I'm not catching uh, a rapid rise in the PSA that would warrant treatment. I usually do a prostate exam in six to 12 months. By recommendations, we say six to 12 months. That's kind of printed in the literature. Now that we have MRI, I think an MRI of the prostate gives way better anatomic information about the prostate than a digital rectal exam. Do I do digital rectal exams? Absolutely. Are they important? I think absolutely. Are they the be-all, end-all? 
No, I don't think so. I think that uh, with the advent of MRI fusion biopsy, I think men do, uh, you know, our ability to find uh, prostate cancers lurking in other places. I'll put it back in the fridge. Uh, are, no. uh, are, uh, the MRI is just phenomenal. Um, so usually I'll do an MRI at 6 to 12 months. Generally, I do it at that 12-month mark um, because if you have, for instance, a Gleason 6 prostate cancer, your PSA is relatively stable. Uh, I think PSA is a good uh, early indicator of worsening disease. Um, and so generally speaking, I'm checking that PSA at six months and at that 12 months. But by recommendations, we are doing biopsies, that first biopsy at that one-year mark. And generally, I will do an MRI fusion biopsy at that time. If the MRI does not show any specific lesion, then I will still do a biopsy, but it'll just be the standard 12-core, 24-core biopsy, depending on the size of the prostate at the time of the initial biopsy or at the time of that MRI. Okay. Quick question. Quick, yeah. quick question about the MRI. Uh, I'm drawing a blank on the score, but <laughs> it's a one through five score. So how much weight do you place on that score, whether it's a, cause I've had the same, the exact same MRI at one institution read as a three and then another radiologist at another institution read it as a five. Yes. <laughs> same very, picture. very, very good question. So first off, the numbers will go from one to five. One and twos, they will very seldomly even comment because the likelihood of any prostate cancer or clinically significant prostate cancer is super, super low. I look at threes as a coin flip, okay? Really, it's 50-50. So if you just had like a five millimeter Gleason, uh, excuse me, a five millimeter Pyrads three lesion uh, and nothing's really changed on your PSA, I don't think you necessarily need an MRI biopsy at that time. Four is about 60 to 80 um, percent, uh, you know, concerning for a cancer. And then once you get to five, about 80 to 90 percent. I think once we get to 100 percent, like to say this is a Pyrads 5 lesion, you, you know, have prostate cancer, that's when this MRI will really skyrocket in terms of reducing overtreatment. Um, but we're not there yet. And that's that's a very critical point to be made. The other point to be made here is that it's dependent on the radiologists and the type of MRI. So I'll hit the second point first, type of MRI. You got to have a three Tesla MRI, which is a strong magnetic uh, field to get very pinpoint accuracy in terms of what the prostate looks like. Okay. Um, so a three Tesla MRI, let's say that we do at Christ Hospital and let's say there's a man who has um, for instance, uh, claustrophobia, and goes to ProScan and gets an open MRI, they're not the same. So even though they both had an MRI of the prostate, they are not the same. Uh, they're, they're, you, have to, you have to have the right equipment to interpret, uh, and the right radiologist to interpret you know, the findings uh, the right way. Um, at Christ Hospital, we have only three or four radiologists that generally read MRIs of the pelvis, MRIs of the prostate, and that's important. You know, it, it would be nice to say every radiologist reads MRIs of the prostate. It's actually good to have only several. And the reason for that is they really look at a lot of them and they know what they're looking for. Okay. Um, so oftentimes when I see an MRI lesion and I do a biopsy on that lesion, I'm actually looking at that data and I'm saying, how many of these scores of threes or fours or fives on that MRI? are actually correlating with the published data showing that it's a 50-50 for a PIRADS 3, 60-80% in a PIRADS 4, and nearing 80-90% to in a PIRADS 5. And at Christ Hospital, I think we do a very good job sticking to that data that's published, um, as opposed to saying, hey, some radiologist called it a score of 5, and now I biopsied it six times and there's no cancer there, right? Uh, that That's a very important thing. So getting the right test, um, getting, uh, meaning a three Tesla MRI, uh, having a, a trained radiologist reading it, and then a proper urologist to interpret that data and know how to actually technically do 
the MRI fusion, I think, are three of the most important things. Did that sorry, answer? sorry to interrupt again, but real quickly. So no. I had so I, I had the same I had this one one film one, or one one image, one MRI taken with the gold standard type of machine, uh, read by two different radiologists, two different institutions. One is a three, one as a five, which is a huge difference, right? Yet all the other biopsies, everything else says active surveillance. The five, at least to one uh, um, uh, uh, physician, says uh, you, you should have treatment because of the five. Yeah, so, so you bring up a good point there. You're not asking the question, but it's leading to a question. What does the three, four, and five mean in terms of grade of the prostate cancer. It's not making any statement as to what type of prostate cancer you have, just whether you have cancer or not. Does that make sense? Yes. So it's not a grading system like a Gleason score of six, seven, eight, nine, or 10. It's just saying, what is the likelihood that this particular lesion is cancerous versus not cancerous? And that's where that 50%, 60 to 80%, 80 to 90% come in, right? If a radiologist looks at a lesion and says, this is basically 50-50, whether you're going to find cancer here, which, which you would score as a three, I may not need to do a biopsy. It's not telling me whether that's a Gleason 6, 7, 8, 9, or 10. Whereas a five, for instance, if they say, look, it's probably cancer, I can biopsy that area and it shows up as a six, or I can biopsy that area and it shows up at a nine. There's no correlation between the way the lesion looks and what the final pathology ends up being. So that's a very important point here to be made about what that grading system of MRI is utilized for. Thank you. Uh -huh. Does that make sense? Yep. Yes, absolutely. Thank right. you. So factors affecting active surveillance. So, you know, I've got, let's say I have you on active surveillance. We're monitoring the PSAs. Um, we're doing all this. Factors that get you off the hamster wheel. And I kind of mentioned these a little bit earlier. The PSA velocity, how fast is that PSA going up in what amount of time? Um, the Gleason upgrading. So let's say you started out at a Gleason 6, and now you have a Gleason 7. Or let's say, for instance, you had one core of Gleason 3 plus 4, and now a year later we biopsy and I find three biopsies of Gleason 4 plus 3. That's going to change some things because your risk stratification is no longer favorable intermediate, it's unfavorable intermediate. So there may be some high risk characteristics there. Um, the volume of disease. Do you have one out of 12 cores positive? You have, you know, a year later you have five out of 12 cores positive. Generally speaking, if those are still a score of six and the PSA is relatively stable, I don't take too much stock in that alone, but let's say it's one out of 12 cores of a Gleason 3 plus 4, and now I have five out of 12 of a Gleason 3 plus 4. Yeah, I think you need to have treatment. Um, the certain genetic uh, genomic testings like Decipher, Prolaris, looking at the MRI changes, um, uh, and then also patient anxiety, right? Uh, you may have a one out of 12 cores of Gleason 7, and you, I'm, you know, I may talk to you and say, hey, you would be a good active surveillance candidate. And you're like, okay, I'm on it. And now six months later, you're like, I just, I can't, I can't sleep at night worrying about my Gleason 7 prostate cancer. And then I generally will bring those men back, obviously, for active surveillance. And I'll tell them, hey, look, uh, statistically, this probably won't cause you issues. But by the book, because you do have an intermediate risk prostate cancer, you probably, you know, treatment would be warranted here. So active surveillance may be an option for someone with a score of three plus four, but not necessarily a recommendation. Um, and who are not active uh, or not candidates for active surveillance, what is your recommendation? Is there any form of focal treatment at Christ Hospital? So if not an active surveillance and treatment is indicated, you know, I have a really long discussion regarding the pros and cons of treatment. Um, I talk about radical prostatectomy versus radiation therapy. There's various forms. Um, at Christ Hospital, we offer uh, stereotactic brachytherapy, um, uh, which is a really truncated form of radiation for a particular, uh, uh, you have to meet certain criteria in terms of urinary symptoms, prostate size, um, et cetera. 
Um, we also have conventional external beam uh, radiotherapy. There's other places that have uh, proton beam therapy, cyber knife therapy, et cetera. Um, uh, oftentimes, uh, you know, those forms of radiation therapy are not necessarily covered by insurance. Um, they did some head-to-head -head trials of conventional radiation versus stuff like proton beam therapy with the idea that the side effect profile was less with proton beam therapy uh, or the risk of uh, short and long-term side effects were worse, I mean, uh, were better. Um, but that didn't really pan out. Those studies actually show that it's probably non-inferior, meaning proton beam therapy, cyber knife therapy probably aren't any worse uh, than conventional radiation therapy. Now there's a difference between probably not worse versus better, right? Um, so, so that's something that, that uh, you know, we, we generally will talk about. Treatment depends on a variety of factors, you know. Uh, I don't just look at age, you know. Do I take, have I taken out prostates in men who are 72 years old? Sure. Do I generally take prostates out of men who are 81 years old? No, I don't, right. Will you find a urologist that may do that? You very well may. Um, so it depends really on the patient, it depends on the physician, it depends on having the right conversation and discussing all of the finer details and making that decision. You know, uh, if you go to someone who's just doing surgery and doesn't know about all the aspects of prostate cancer, you may go to them and they say, hey, you've got cancer, it needs to come out. I don't practice medicine that way. I think you should have all the options at your disposal. Uh, and I think uh, you have to look at a variety of factors. What is your surgical risk with regards to your medical issues? You know, we touched on that a little bit earlier. Have you had multiple prior abdominal surgeries? You know, have you had perineal dialysis before? Have you had hernia repairs? Have you had bowel surgery? Have you had a, a gastric bypass surgery? You know, have you had your kidney removed? There can be scarring in the abdomen. So those things are extremely important uh, to know prior to just saying, hey, you need surgery because there are surgical risks. Uh, what is your preoperative urinary health? You know, uh, looking at some of these questionnaires, you know, is your urinary score low? Is it high? Um, and that's going to factor into whether you're a good radiation candidate versus surgery candidate. If you're having all the urinary symptoms in the world and a big prostate, radiation may not be best for you because that's only going to get worse over time. Um, I look at uh, things called the Johns Hopkins nomograms. Uh, and uh, can you guys still see my screen? Are you guys still able to see my screen? Yes. I think you're good. Yes. Yep. So yep. there's something, for instance, called these, you know, Johns Hopkins. Um, can, can you see what I'm looking at right now? Yes. We're still seeing your, your uh, slides. Oh, you are? Okay. So let me, let me, all right. Can you see this now? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is called the Parton table data. So, you know, for instance, if I say, oh, this, you have a PSA of five and a half, you have Gleason three plus four, and I diagnose this based on just the biopsy, you know, I look at all these numbers, you know, what are the numbers that, you, what is the likelihood that your cancer is confined to the prostate, that it's potentially gone outside? has gone to the seminal vesicles or the lymph node. And here's here's a good point, for instance. Let's say we have Gleason score of six, and I, say, I have a guy who has a PSA, for instance, of 12. So these are the original data, if it's a score of a PSA less than 10, and now the PSA may be greater than 10, but look, the lymph node risk is still 1%, right? So I'm not just looking at PSA um, when I'm when I'm having those discussions, you know, let's say the, the uh, gentleman's PSA is between four and six, and the PSA, for instance, is, or the Gleason score is six, compared to now the Gleason score is seven. The risk of lymph node disease is still only one percent, right? So even though you know the Gleason score has gone from you know let's say six to seven. The fine is still pretty high. If you had one out of 12 cores, I may continue to keep an eye on that, right? And there's another set of data here called the Han tables, also out of Johns Hopkins, who gives me information on how men are going to do after prostatectomy. So 
what is the likelihood that their PSA is at three years, five years, seven years, and 10 years, and I always look at 10-year data, what are the chances after removing the prostate that your PSA is going to be still undetectable? Well, if your PSA, if your Gleason score is six, likelihood that if I remove your prostate, you're essentially cured of it is 95% at 10 years. I look at that in another way to say, hey, if your PSA or if your Gleason score is six, and there's a 95% chance that you can be cured of this by 10 years, do you really need anything done about it, right? Um, whereas, for instance, if we go to a score of seven, yeah, this number drops down to about 90% chance that your PSA remains undetectable, 10% that the PSA starts to rise. Um, and now let's say your PSA, you're on active surveillance and your PSA was seven and now it's gone up to 13. Well, now the numbers start to change a little bit, okay? So I use this as part of my counseling uh, when, I'm, when I'm speaking, uh, you know, to my, uh, to my patients. And I actually have that data uh, on there. Um, focal, a uh, couple other points. Um, how important is it to, for you to know that the cancer is out pathologically? So some men are like, I want this cancer out. If it's already intermediate risk, I don't want to keep an eye on it. Um, let's get it out. And then we have a discussion about that. Um, a risk assessment. You know, if cancer returned after you removed the prostate, we know that radiation is possible in a salvage setting, meaning you can still try to get things in remission. If cancer returns after you've had radiation first, Surgery often is not an option because there's a lot of scarring down in the pelvis and surgery done on scarring leads to more scarring and more side effects. So, um, you know, generally speaking, if you kind of resign yourself to hormone treatments, uh, if you have radiation first, uh, but the point here is that if you have an intermediate risk prostate cancer, for instance, the cure of surgery and radiation are the exact same. So the goal is to do a one and done, but some men are like, well, if there's a possibility that I needed something after, I don't want to resign myself to hormone shots uh, after radiation. Where other men are saying, hey, look, if I have a 90% chance of being cured of this by 10 years, even with radiation, if it comes back, I'm fully prepared of getting hormone shots after that. So that's part of my counseling. Um, focal therapy uh, at Christ Hospital. Do we currently have it? We don't. Um, you know, the issues I think related to it are the need for long-term data. Um, it's not standard of care yet. Um, sometimes there's some insurance issues with getting coverage for it. Um, and then uh, the last is how do you monitor cancer after focal treatment? Um, can you look at PSA? Can you, if, for instance, you had a six millimeter area on MRI and you had cryotherapy or ultrasound ablation, is MRI going to be a good tool to know that you've treated it successfully? Is PSA going to be a good tool to know you've successfully treated? Uh, it's a difficult sort of um, discussion there. And we don't have those hammered out yet. Um, so even if you see a physician at an academic center that, that says, you know, hey, let's talk about focal therapy, they're obligated to tell you those things that, you know, it's not necessarily standard of care, um, but it can certainly be done. It's generally reserved for research studies as research is coming out for it, or elderly men with very low volume disease and contraindications to other forms of standard therapy that still want treatment, okay? Um, so that's an important thing. Um, for men who are, yep. Okay, for men who are candidates uh, only for traditional curative treatment, meaning they're, they're not candidates for active surveillance, or not good candidates for active surveillance, how does surgery stack up against radiation, which today offers high cure rates with fewer side effects than surgery? So I wanna make a point here regarding this question I received. The, this, the main thing is fewer side effects. I would put a little carrot here and I would say fewer short-term side effects than surgery, okay? Uh, we know that radiation has short-term and long-term side effects. Short-term, you may have some urgency and frequency and maybe some burning and some fatigue, maybe rectal spasms, but you're not going to have the erectile dysfunction. You're not going to have leakage. You're not going to have uh, 
significant obstructive symptoms, but then there's a lull for years. And then if you live long enough, you're going to have the long-term side effects that are, that are difficult to deal with. Radiation uh, cystitis, uh, bleedy bladder, bleedy prostate, scar tissue in your prostate, pelvic pain, scarring, rectal spasms, rectal bleeding. You can have these. Do, does that happen to all men? Absolutely not. Um, would it happen to a man that I treated with radiation at age 55 compared to a man I treated with radiation at 70? For certain in the 55-year-old guy, if he lives long enough, the 75-year-old guy may not have very many of those long-term symptoms. So uh, that's extremely important. Um, so the caveat here is, you know, this question says, it, it makes it sound like radiation offers equal cure, but certain fewer side effects. You have to look at not only short-term, but also long-term side effects. So this is, for any of you that are interested in uh, basic uh, macroeconomics, this is actually a supply-demand curve. Uh, but I think, it, uh, I think it works really well for short-term, long-term side effects of radiation versus surgery. Um, think about price as side effects and think about the x-axis as time, okay? On the front end with surgery, the price is going to be high, right? You're going to have maybe some incontinence, some convalescence time period. You're going to have to have a catheter per week. You're going to have erectile issues. And over time, that's actually going to improve, okay? The cost to you is actually going to go down. With radiation, you may not have very many symptoms on the front end, but flash forward 15, 20 years, you're going to have all those symptoms that I discussed. So now, is it as sharp of a decline and is it as sharp of a rise as this? No. Um, imagine this being somewhere way out here and this some, being something way out here. Okay. Uh, so, so, but I, but I use this to kind of illustrate that radiation, you may not have as many side effects on the front end, but maybe on the back end. Surgery you may have more side effects on the front end, but not on the back. End. Okay. Um, so you do have to look at short and long-term side effects. How is a treatment decision made at Christ Hospital? Are patients made fully aware of uh, the chance of cure versus serious side effects of surgery? Um, oh, where are my other two slides? One second. Must have skipped over them. Sorry, give me just a second. Can you all see this? Uh, no, that's the active surveillance one. Sorry, give me just one second. I'm just finding. Uh... Okay, so let me share something new with you guys. Okay, can you guys see this? Are you guys able to see this? I know it's small. Yeah, but we, can, this, we can see it, but it's hard to read. Yeah, it's hard to read. So this, I just use this as an illustration to show you what my office note looks like when I counsel men for prostate cancer treatment. And the reason I bring this up is I'm looking at a variety of factors when I'm discussing, okay? So if you look at the top here, I'm looking at the stage, you know, uh, I'm looking at risk stratification the Gleason score, the ultrasound prostate volume, or an MRI volume. Have you had any abdominal surgeries? What is your decipher Prolaris score? I'm looking at that Parton table data, the Han nomogram data. I'm looking at all your PSAs. I'm looking at your questionnaires. I'm looking at your risk factors in terms of age, being African American, having family history. I'm looking at, I'm discussing all of these factors in treatment with you. Do you have erections? Do you have a median lobe of the prostate that may, may, may make surgery a little bit harder? or radiation a little bit harder. And then I talk about the various different uh, treatment options uh, and we kind of go line by line about those. And then I talk about primarily surgery versus radiation versus active surveillance versus hormone therapy as it relates to each man. So my point in illustrating this is just to show you that when I see a man and I'm talking, you know, a man with prostate cancer and uh, we're talking about the difficult diagnosis in the first place, we're hitting on every single one of these issues 
uh, when during our discussion. So again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, every man is different. Okay. Um, so can you all see this? Am I back to my PowerPoint presentation? Yeah. I am. Okay. So the last question is, you know, that I got um, uh, is, you know, 69 year old, actually two questions. I don't want to forget that other one that uh, we were given, but a 69 year old man has Gleason three plus four prostate cancer with only 10 to 20% uh, percent, uh, grade four uh, genetic tests on, sorry, I kind of scribbled this fast. So sorry for the, for the typos. Genetic tests on uh, the biopsy prostate cancer showed low risk. Um, PSA is 10 and was four some seven years ago before the current PSA. Would you treat him and how or advise him to do nothing because of the odds that he'll die from something other than prostate cancer? So this is a very good case vignette after us having talked about all the different factors that I looked at or that we would have discussed. So on the one hand, you've got a 69 year old gentleman on the other hand, on on the other hand, you also have a guy with Gleason seven disease. He's got ten to twenty percent of the grade group uh, four on uh, on there, um, and his PSA is rising. So, a couple of things that I would want to know is what are the PSAs doing during that time? Uh, number two, how many cores of Gleason three plus four were there compared to were there any four plus three? Uh, were there any three plus three in there? What is his overall health? What does he want out of it? Um, is this the first biopsy he's had or is this uh, subsequent biopsies that he's had? Um, and uh, so, so, and, and what does he want out of it, right? So when I counsel men on this, I say, hey, look, you have a favorable intermediate prostate cancer where the cure rates of radiation and surgery are the same, okay? It's all about what side effects you're willing to put up with. So I'll do a history about has he had abdominal surgeries and what's his overall health, perception of his overall health, all the things we talked about earlier. And I'll say on the one hand, radiation has some short-term side effect, uh, long-term side effects. On the other hand, surgery has more short-term and less long-term side effects. But I tell all men with surgery, you will have leakage on the front end, which will improve. You will have erectile issues, which uh, will and should improve. You just may need an erectile aid. The other thing that I'll counsel this man on is how important is it to you at age 69 to have it out, no that the prostate cancer has been removed, the lymph nodes are negative, and that your PSA comes to an undetectable level. If he's like, hey, the cure rates are the same for both, and I don't want surgery. I think radiation is a perfectly good option for him, provided the prostate is within a reasonable size and he's not having very many urinary symptoms. If he has urgency, frequency, weak stream, intermittency, waking up four times a night, has a large median lobe of his prostate and his, and his uh, 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 prostate volumes like 100, then I say, you know, if you're having a lot of urinary symptoms and you have a big prostate, removal of the prostate may serve you better because to put, to put that much radiation in a prostate that big, you may not get it all or you may have every symptom in the world during treatment but also down the line, okay? So with regards to surgery, I would say, you know, if you had surgery, like if he had settled on surgery, one thing we have in our back pocket for instance, if prostate cancer recurs six, seven years down the line, is uh, we have radiation in our back pocket. So if the PSA, let's say seven, eight, 10 years down the line, after being undetectable, goes to 0.1, and then it goes to 0.2, and then it goes to 0.4, then it goes to 0.6 or 0.8, we can always do radiation to the area where the prostate used to be because statistically, the recurrent prostate cancer cells are going to be in and around that area, okay? Particularly if the PSA is rising slowly, okay? Uh, if the PSA is rising very quickly, then oftentimes I'll do some imaging studies just to make sure that there's no prostate cancer that's already sprouted in the lymph nodes or bone or something like that, okay? So with surgery, you have radiation in your back pocket. With radiation, you can't really do surgery after it. 
um, because of the scarring issues, but at the same token, uh, um, you know, you have to be kind of okay if the PSA rises significantly to start on hormone shots, which have their own sort of um, side effects. Um, so that's how I would counsel this man. If he has a good performance status, he's otherwise healthy, takes care of himself, active, motivated, uh, compliant, uh, then I would say he'd be a good surgical candidate, uh, provided he understood the risks and benefits. Okay. Does that make sense? 